If you turn once again to the book of Revelation, we are still in Revelation chapter 1. You'll find that at the back of your Bibles, the last book in the Bible. And we will be looking at verses 9 through 20. Now, as you turn there, um, yesterday I conducted a funeral in West Virginia for my aunt who passed away this past week. And, you know, I, I did what many uh, do in, in such occasions. I, I quoted from obviously various portions of scripture, but one that is most often heard is comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I read to my family members who were there, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. And you're on the way to the funeral home and then up to the grave site I drove past the homes of both my grandparents that one of them now lays empty the other one's owned by people I don't know but they were the homes that I spent many a lot of time in running around with my cousins running around the yard I, I just you know, the, the movie reel was playing through my mind as I just, I, I pictured what once was. And then when I arrived at the gravesite, there were laying in the ground my great-grandfather, aunts, uncles. And as you can imagine, just wave after wave after wave of nostalgia just, just hitting, hitting me. And I was speaking to one of my cousins about this who, whose mother it was we were doing the funeral for and I said you know coming to this place it's just this sense of melancholy because you you just you remember and you remember the joy that you had gathering as a family and now we're spread all around the country and I realize that and it's more than likely that I will probably never see some of those cousins again alive um, because some live in Texas some live in Detroit and um but I was reflecting on that as I was talking to them as, as part of the service. And I read this, this passage in Ecclesiastes and I said, you know, it says blessed or, or better is it to be in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. And why is that? And you hear so many talk about the blessings that, that come along with funerals, which is the family reunion. And you come together and you share these stories. And I say, that is a blessing. I mean, there is kind of that kind of silver lining that comes with it. But that's not what this is talking about. That's not the blessing that this, that's not the better that the word ha, is, is thinking of when it says better it is to be in the house of mourning. What's better about being here than in a house of feasting? What it does is it causes us to stop and reflect once again on our own mortality. That as, as I, I, I look upon my aunt who's laying right there next to me in the casket that... I'll one day be laying there, just as everybody here in this room will one day be laying there. And we need to remember that. We've got to be reminded that our life is but a vapor. And that as, as I just prayed that what the world, what this world offers us is but vanity. And our lives are but a mist. And so, so we need to really do some hard thinking about what our lives are made of and what will happen on that day when that is us. Do we have the confidence of knowing that death will be but a transition to presence with the Lord? Can we say with Paul? That I really struggle with what, what is better right now. You know, it, it's, it's good for me to remain here alive, for he says, for the sake of the church. But it's better for me to be here for the sake of my family, for my kids, so that I can be there as a father to them and as a husband to my wife and, 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 a, and, a, and a pastor to, to this church. This is, this is good. But oh, how much better would it be? 
to be with the Lord right now. Amen. And Paul says, that, that, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tension then within me. I want to stay here for your sake, but boy, I'm ready to go. You know, I've heard people talk like that before, and I always thought that was really strange. I remember hearing John Piper speak at a conference. I wasn't there. I saw it on YouTube. And he said, while they were praising, lifting up songs before the, um, he got up to speak, he said, I found myself praying, Lord, now, right now, just take me. And he says, am I strange in that? Does anybody else think like that? I used to think that was really strange. I don't think that's really strange anymore. So I've thought more and more about this subject and about in what my real hope lies and the eternal promise as compared to what we've got here. And I hope that you share that hope. And if this sounds really strange to talk like this, then I'd really encourage you to stop and consider why. Why is it so strange to think that it'd be better to pass right now and to be in the presence of Christ? You know, that's, that's the, the, the subject, that it's that whole realm of, of thinking that causes people to shy away from revelation. All right, we've talked about this the last two weeks. We were like, you know, I've not really spent any time in Revelation because it scares me because it talks about all this stuff to come and I don't really want to think about those things. We want to kind of throw our brains in neutral in some ways and not think about death in the same way maybe in Revelation we've tended to avoid it because we don't want to think about some of the, the images that are there and the, the unknown, if you will, even though we're given all these details are still kind of a mystery mysterious unknown to it and so we're concerned about digging into it and if that has been you then this passage is for you because Christ is about to tell John this is why I want you to write this book down in the first place it's because of feelings like that so let's read this is Revelation chapter 1 Starting in verse 9, I'll read to the end of the chapter. This is the word of God. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And this is... The word of God. Well, as we begin to look at this, I, I want you to know something right out of the gate. See what John says when he starts. Verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. 
What does that say about the timing of the tribulation? The tribulation is not simply a future event. It is a now event. Well, man, John wrote this 2,000 years ago. So this was a past event that continues through the present and will go on into the future until the Lord's return. And this shouldn't be a surprise. This is, after all, what John calls the last hour. And again, he's writing 2,000 years ago. We are living in the last hour, he says. Paul, we saw say, we are living in the last days. And so we should expect tribulation now because that is one of the signs that the end is near. Will it get worse? Well, certainly it will get worse. Matthew 24, Jesus tells us that it will get worse. But it will get worse in relation to the expansion of the preaching of the gospel. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 24. Because he says that the gospel will spread to all nations. It will spread around the world. And as it spreads, tribulation will increase. Jesus says the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So along with the spread of the gospel comes an increase in persecution, both being signs then that the end is upon us. And so persecution, tribulation, both was and is today a very real possibility for believers. And so we don't have to wait for some grand event to happen in the future to experience tribulation. And Christians around the world right now can testify to that. Right now, this very day, our brothers and sisters around the world are being tortured, are being imprisoned, are being beheaded for their faith. And what is Jesus' message to a church that is facing things such as this? We see it here. John saying himself, I'm a partner with you in the tribulation. Because he's been exiled. In fact, tradition has it that he was dunked into a vat of boiling oil, but somehow the Lord preserved his life before he was exiled. And what does the Lord have to say to people like that? To face tribulation like that? What Jesus says to John, don't fear. Fear not. Now, certainly he's responding to the fact that that John has fallen at his feet as if dead. I mean, John casts his eyes upon Jesus and hits the ground. And this, by the way, is what would really happen if you were to encounter the risen Christ. You hear a lot of preachers these days that talk about having visions of Christ, encounters with Jesus. And you ask, well, well, what did you do? Well, I gave him a big old hug. I don't think so. That pretty much tells me that you're making stuff up. Because if we were to encounter the risen Christ, we would do what John did here. We would fall flat on our face as if dead. And what Jesus does is he places his hands upon him. And says, don't fear. But then after he tells John to not fear, he says, write therefore about what you're going to see. So it seems like what Jesus is saying to John is, yet, yet, John, don't fear me as I stand before you, but don't fear what you're about to see. What I'm communicating to you is intended to eradicate fear. 
Don't fear, therefore, write this down. I'm giving this to you, in other words, in order to cast away fear. I'm giving this to you to pass along to the church that they may not fear. Don't fear the visions you're about to see. Don't fear what you're about to be told. So the whole point of this section, I think, in verses 9 through 20, is to lay before us and to lay before John why he should write these words down. And the reason is, the goal is, that the visions he will receive are to teach us, to teach him, and then in turn us, to not fear. Well, how so? Well, the book of Revelation is going to present before us Jesus. It is a revelation of Jesus, meaning that it's not only coming from Jesus to the angels that are going to pass it on to John, but it is a revelation of Jesus. Through it, we will see Jesus. And when we cast our eyes upon the living Christ, it is intended to cast away all fear of the world around us. To cast away all fear of what is to come. Because when we cast our eyes upon Jesus... We are seeing Jesus revealed to us as the first and the last, the living one who died and who is alive forevermore, the one who has in his hands the keys to death and Hades. If we will grasp these things about Christ, it will drive away fear. And in order to do that, he gives us this book of Revelation. To illustrate these truths about Christ. And that really is what this book is. A book of illustrations of who Jesus is. But as a prologue of what's what's coming here in these verses right here. he He just lays it out for us straight. And he does that not only in what he says to John, but he also does it in how he reveals himself to John. So let, let's start there. So verse 9, you've got John. He says he's in exile on the island of Patmos because of his sharing about Christ. And it says on the Lord's day, he is in the spirit. Now the Lord's day, the Lord's day is Sunday. Sunday came to be called the Lord's day because that was the day upon which Jesus rose from the dead. And so it became the day when Christians would gather to worship the Lord. And eventually it came to be known in the church as the Christian Sabbath. And that's, again, why why we meet on this day, while we still meet on this day to this day. And so Easter is not the one Sunday out of the year that we gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. And that's by design. And this is the call upon the church to gather in this way, to worship. I had a gentleman from, um, from Egypt who was a member of our, our last church. And his family was still in Egypt. They were all believers. And he was telling me about what life in Egypt is like. And he said, well, because it's a Muslim so- a society, uh, Friday and Saturdays are their weekends. Sunday is a work day. And so out of curiosity, I asked, so when does the church gather in Egypt? He said, Sunday, of course. We gather to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Actually, when he answered that way, which is the way he answered, I felt kind of silly that I even asked the question. Of course, that's when you meet. We meet on the Lord's Day. And so here John is on on the Lord's Day and it says that he is in the spirit. And what we see here is that John is is describing and and putting forth before us the fact that the way he's receiving the book of Revelation is the same way that the prophets received the visions that they received. Here he is in the spirit when he's confronted by the Son of Man and he says that he falls on his face as if dead. Well, listen to how Ezekiel described his experience. He writes of encountering the glory of the Lord. And he says this, when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. 
And as he spoke to me, the spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. And so here's John. He's having the same experience that Ezekiel had. And when John turns to see the voice speaking to him, what he sees is the seven lampstands and and one standing in the midst of these lampstands who is one like the son of man. Now we know the seven lampstands, he tells us, represent the seven churches. The son of man, who is that? On its face, the phrase son of man simply means someone who is in human form, as opposed to, say, the four living creatures that we'll read about in Revelation 4, which are before the throne. But it means so much more than that. Many of us will be familiar with the fact that son of man was Jesus's favorite name for himself. He uses it some 69 times throughout the Gospels, referring to himself as the Son of Man. One of the most important places is in Mark 14, and where the high priest encounters Jesus and says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus responds, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And at at that point, the high priest and the others there accuse Jesus of blasphemy and say that he's worthy of death. Why? Because in saying that and declaring himself the son of man, he was claiming that he himself was divine. And so, I mean, this is one of those places that when people say, and you'll hear people say this, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, you need to know the scriptures. You need to understand what Jesus is saying. Maybe he doesn't say these words. Hey, I am God. But they knew what he was saying and they were ready to kill him for it. And of course, as we see through the book of Revelation, we see him consistently presenting himself as none other than the living God. And it's, it's kind of convenient for people to say, Jesus never claimed to be God, but they won't turn and open up the book of Revelation. They want to stick to the gospel accounts, but even there, they just miss it. And so here Jesus is saying that he is the, the son of man. And what he's doing is he's making an appeal back to there's two places in Daniel where this language is used. So Daniel chapter 7. Where Daniel writes, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And Jesus says, that's me. I was the one given authority. I am the one. To whom dominion has been given, everlasting dominion that will never pass away. In Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 5, listen to this description that Daniel has of this son of man. And And think of what we just read in Revelation in light of this. This is Daniel 10, starting in verse 5. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. John is having the same encounter with the same son of man. 
Jesus Christ, the living God. And here Jesus Christ, who is now in the midst of the churches, represented by these lampstands. And it was the job of the priests in the temple to keep the lampstands burning, to keep the lands burning. They would add the oil, they trim the wicks. And the idea was as long as the lamps continue to burn, so will the presence of God continue to remain with his people. And so here we have Christ in the midst of the lampstands, our great high priest keeping the lamps burning. He's providing for us that which he needs. It is him as a great high priest through the work of the spirit. It's by his work that the presence of God is manifested here among us. And it is his work that determines whether or not the flame continues to burn or not. In his right hand, we're told that he had seven stars. And in verse 20, they, we're told that they represent the angels of the seven churches. And there's a lot of discussion over what does that mean? Who are these angels of the seven churches? Uh, the word angel, just literally translated, just simply means messenger. And so some argue that what this is referring to are the messengers of Christ in each church. And so in particular, perhaps the elders of the church. Others argue that stars in the Old Testament refer to the righteous and wise ones who have died and who are now in the presence of God. And so the idea being here that Christ dwells among the living in his church, but also still holds in his hand those who have passed on. Others believe that uh, the, the word angel here, the way it's used throughout the rest of the book, it does refer to heavenly beings. So we shouldn't expect that that should change throughout the course of the book. So it's most naturally to be understood as as an angel. And so perhaps maybe it's speaking of a guardian angel that is responsible for the care of each individual church. If we want to try to noodle our way through the middle of all that we might want to say well we can at least say that from this that we understand that christ again he he's among the living but he also holds within his hand he's he's sovereign over the dead he's sovereign over the heavenly host he is sovereign over all and maybe that's what's being represented here but what is interesting that um you know, to be honest, when I when I read it, I, I do sympathize with the idea. He's talking about angels here. He talks about angels and in in, as he moves along. So it seems like we should understand this to be heavenly beings. But it says when he, we get to the letters, which we'll do next week, it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And so it's like, well, well I'm not really understanding writing a letter to the angel in Ephesus and delivering the letter to the church. So it seems to maybe lean on the side that it is referring to um, the elders in the church. And I will admit, as you can imagine, that there's great comfort in knowing that this could be an image of myself and Wade, you know, being held up by the hand of the Lord and to know that we're under the Savior's providential intentional care. He holds the elders in one hand as he walks among the congregation. That's a beautiful picture. But I, I don't honestly don't know exactly where to land on that. Either either interpretation works. And then we see that it says that from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Verse 16 now, we're going to see this referenced again. We, we've talked about this briefly already, about how the, the Bible is referenced, referred to as the, the sword of the spirit in Ephesians chapter six. We looked at Psalm 146, where it says that the praises of the people are like a sword or the praises of the, the, um, the Messiah will be like a sword to, to cut down the nations, which makes sense. But we see this referenced actually in Revelation 2.16. When he says, 
to the church in Pergamum. He says to them, the, to people who are within their church, who have been taken away by false teaching, who are spreading false teaching and are spreading sexual immorality, he calls them to repent. And he says, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. And so we know that this is the words of Christ, but it's not merely the word of God, but it is the word of God coming out in judgment. It's his voice speaking words of judgment and wrath, which will accomplish what they say. Now, just right there, this vision would cause any of us to fall flat on our faces. And whereas in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel says he saw the vision of the Son of Man in this type of appearance. And he, he landed on his face, and, but he says an angel then came and comforted him with words. But in this case, it's not simply an angel. It is Christ himself. And he lays his right hand on John's shoulder and he says... Fear not. And here we find the amazing grace of Christ as he is willing to stoop down and lay his hands upon John and by implication, us. Isaiah 42 speaks of this Jesus, telling us that he will bring forth justice, undoubtedly with the sword of the spirit of his words of justice and wrath and judgment. But then it says this, a bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Now, when we come to Christ, we all want to be strong, tall, redwood trees in the faith. We want to stand sturdy in the face of life's storms. <coughs> Providing shelter even from the rain for those who are under our care. Roots digging deep into the earth of the word of God rather than just resting on the surface of shifting sand. The green of our leaves, the fruitfulness of our lives being evident for all to see. When we come to Christ, we want to be on fire for the Lord. In fact, we'll use that language, being on fire for God, casting warmth and casting light all around, constantly being refined in our holiness as we grow in Christ. But everyone goes through periods when rather than being on fire for the Lord, we are but a faintly burning wick, one that you can't hardly see. Anything but the slight glow of spiritual life left in us. That little ember on the top of the wick of a candle. Rather than emanating light and warmth, there's just this light little wafting of smoke that reaches up to the ceiling that may be well representing the strength or lack thereof of our prayers at the time and rather than that strong tree that we long to be we are but a small reed like the stalk of a weed and and not only that we are bruised in other words we've been bent over the the storms that have gone through our lives have have caused us to fold over And if we're able to, to bounce back, we still have that little bit of a slant in us. You can still look at us and you see the bruises of the bending that took place during that time. And sometimes we feel like we cannot spiritually stand straight up at all. And in those times, we wonder, what use has God for me? What does Jesus think of me now? I was listening to a song on the way in here. Um, 
It was the first CD I ever bought after coming out of seminary, and I used it, I cranked it in my car to encourage me as I was trying to plant my church. It's a ska band called the Supertones. Anybody ever heard of the Supertones? You ought to get this CD. I'll make copies for you all. It is so good from beginning to end, the words. And on the way in this morning, I was listening to him sing, My God, I see not what you see. My God, what do you see in me? And that's our cry so much the time of our lives, isn't it? What in the world do you see in me? Whatever it is, I don't have the eyes to see it. I can't even stand up straight. And then you re- you read Revelation and you read about coming persecution. <laughs> I can't even stand up straight and when life is good. How am I going to get through that? Can I honestly have any assurance that I would not fold? Can I honestly have no assurance that Jesus is just not going to reach over and snuff out that little ember? That he's not just going to walk up to me that we... And Jesus lays his hand upon our shoulders and says, fear not. Fear not. How can I not? Because, he says, I, the one who placed my hand upon your shoulder, I, the one in whom you believe, even when your faith is strong, you are united to me. You are in union with me through faith. I am the first and the last. He is the beginning. He is the end of all things. Isaiah 41 begins with a description of the one who stands over all in judgment. Who, he says, tramples kings underfoot. And the question is asked, who is this? Who does this? And the response is, I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Isaiah 44, 6 through 7. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 48, 12 through 13. Listen to me. O Jacob and Israel, whom I have called, I am he. I am the first. I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth. And so what is he saying to his people? Fear not. No matter the suffering, no matter the tribulation, he is the one. I am the one who tramples kings underfoot. Even Caesar in John's day, who set himself up as a god, trampled underfoot. Even the president of the United States, trampled underfoot. Even Putin. What do we have to fear? Our God reigns. Our king is king of kings. So fear not. And no matter what other deities that people may call upon, might threaten you with, there are no other gods. They're but idols. Statues made of wood. Real, realistically, in reality, all they're doing is representing demonic powers. That have influenced the people who have made those things. Let's not be fooled here. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all the products of the demonic. And they spread, when their teaching spread, that is the spread of the doctrines of demons. Because there's the ones who inspired these things. And those demons are the very demons that our God, the King of Kings, will cast 
into the fiery pit for all eternity. They do not have the final word. Their threats are but idle threats, empty words spoken against God's people. So Jesus says, fear not. There are no gods beside me. I am the first and the last. And I am the first and the last who laid the foundation of this earth. So, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I don't know if th this is any of you all. I, I'm puzzled. I don't get the fear of global warning. For some, it's really real. But here, Jesus, I laid the foundations of the earth. Do you think I'm going to let mankind throw my plan off track? I am God. I am he. I hold all of this in the palm of my hands. Fear not. God's people ought to be those who are free from anxiety, from any of these things. And we fear not death. Jesus is, he says, the living one who died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys to death and Hades. Jesus is a living one. This is a common phrase used throughout the Old Testament to refer to God, the Lord God. He is the living one. But here Jesus points out, I am the living one, but I also died. And he's putting in front of us both his deity and his humanity, which we both must affirm. He is God, but he did indeed die. But death did not have the final word. He rose again, triumphing over death. Just as he tramples earthly kings underfoot, so death itself is trampled underfoot and is defeated. And those who are united to him, those who are united to the living one in faith, we, the perishable, we put on the imperishable. We, the mortal, put on immortality. We are able to say, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We are able to say, through Christ, to die is gain. And we are able to say that the idea of departing and being with Christ is far better than remaining here. Through Christ, we join with the saints who have come before us. That the writer of Hebrews said, we're desiring a better country, a heavenly one. They always had their eyes on the true reward. We join with the faith of Moses that we are told in Hebrews 11, rather than be mistreated he chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking forward to the reward and so Jesus says have no fear death in Haiti I've got the keys right here Death and Hades. I, I, I'm in control. He utilizes those keys every time he welcomes somebody into his presence. Saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Deuteronomy 32, 39 through 41 reads, See now that I... Even I am he. There is no God besides me. I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever. God is in control. Christ has the keys. Threats against God's people are empty threats as he will stay the hands of any who desire to harm us unless he's ready to call us unto himself. And that will be to our joy. And so to John, he writes, or says to John, write 
therefore, the things you've seen, those that are, and those that are about to take place after this. Why? So that my people will not fear. Let's pray.